We need to save Tracer's victory pose. The feminazis are coming to get us. Oh no, he's too sexy. Change him. Change him. <laughs> An argument I see fairly often is that male characters in video games set just as many ridiculous standards for men as their female counterparts and are objectified just as much. So the question is, Objectified by who? To understand objectification, we really need to understand power fantasy. A power fantasy is designed to make you feel powerful. Stop me if I'm going too quickly for you. Games are especially good at this because player interaction gives a sense of direct involvement in the events on screen. You get to pretend you're the muscle man badass inside your flicker box. And given that you're literally controlling their actions, you kind of are. When beated in God of War, the player doesn't say, oh dear, Kratos, the character over whom I exert control has been killed. They say, I'm dead. I'm dead. No, they killed me. The player is encouraged to identify with Kratos and vicariously feel the effects of his actions, which they literally control. And together, the player helps Kratos get his various flimsily justified revenges by being very good at committing killicide on a variety of fantasy creatures and having sex with ladies. The game even gives you an achievement for it, as if to say, yeah, well done, you did it. He's also ridiculously buff, because it's nice to briefly pretend to be someone the opposite sex might find attractive. But is Kratos an actually, objectively attractive character? Or is he merely what the creators and players might think is attractive? There's the old joke that men grow beards in order to try and look more attractive to women, but their newfound hirsute pursuits tend to only get them compliments from other straight men. Brad Pitt thinks he looks really cool in this picture, but women think Brad looks really cool in this picture. Is it generalizing to say women don't like beards? No, no women like beards. They all hate them. If you say you like beards, you are wrong. You hate them. Obviously there are lots of tastes out there, but would you say a majority of woms or gams want to go out on the town and run into this guy? Watch out, he might score you an achievement, but he might tie you to a gear and murder you just to keep the washroom open. Kratos doesn't set ridiculous standards for men because the objective is to make the male player feel like they already are that person through the simulation of the game world. Let's stop and think for a moment about how players view their avatars as they play games. Let's look at Bayonetta. In Bayonetta, the plot is laid out in such a way that Bayonetta Bayonetta engages with it directly, but you don't. Two hours in, they're still introducing characters you haven't seen before, but Bayonetta has a clear history with that goes just unexplained enough that you're kept at arm's length from really identifying with her and her struggle. She's externalized from the player, keeping you at arm's length. Kratos has an explicit mission and a straightforward story. It's bland, but it's understandable. You're invited to identify on some level with him, or at least be able to put yourself in his shoes during murderthons. But Bayonetta is kept mysterious, doing her own thing. The game never really invites the player to sympathize with her situation. Bayonetta is someone else who you happen to control to help achieve her goals. Also, instead of simply being a good fighter, her animations are worked out to be dances and pseudo strip teases for your amusement as you play. This even extends to the female enemies, sometimes pulling off a special on a boss nets the sort of thing I would normally watch incognito in my browser. I'm not feeling engaged by the characters or getting immersed in the story, this is happening because someone thought I would enjoy seeing it happen, but I didn't need to be pandered to like this, you know? I was enjoying the game already. All this do is make it a lot more embarrassing if someone walks in while you're recording this footage. No, you see, Mum, this is really empowering. Don't you get it? This is what progressive video games look like. Oh boy, I can dress her up in a sexy Samus cosplay. Hang on, why do they need to alter the Samus costume to be more sexy? They already made a sexy costume for Samus. It's called the Phazon suit. Oh yeah! No, I'm not going to decry Bayonetta's character designs or overt sexuality. I'm what people seem to call a sex positive feminist. I've heard some really good things about sex and I'd love to try it sometime. Numerous think pieces have been written on the tumblers about how Bayonetta is a feminist character and the games generally have a progressive message and I kind of agree. The character's powers are implied to be literally powered by feminine sexuality in a way that presents it as something to be truly reckoned with. A force that transgresses garbage patriarchal religion figures and heralds major systemic change. It's cool and a nice twist on the rather more traditional types of female character. Who dress like this for no reason? Please leave a comment explaining how it's actually very empowering to be a tit ninja. All I'm saying is Hideki Kimi's character doesn't feel like a fulfillment of his fantasies of who he wants to be like. It feels like a fantasy of someone he wants to watch. I kind of think he's trying to have his cheesecake and eat it by making a game about an empowered woman being heroic, but making sure you get a nice long look at all of her as she does it. 
So between the two games, we're seeing two different sides of what's ultimately the same fantasy. Bayonetta may be an empowered female character, but she's empowered strictly within the confines of a straight male fantasy. Games as a whole are sadly lacking explorations of other people's fantasies. We're at the point where women actually liking your character is unexpected to the creators themselves. The developers of the Prince of Persia reboot in 2008 were genuinely surprised to discover that they'd somehow accrued quite a large female demographic. In surprising contrast to G.O.W., Pop is about a young man who acts vaguely like a human learns he can't do everything alone, and grows to respect another person enough to risk his life with them on an adventure together where they function as two halves of a team. Perhaps accidentally, the Prince of Prince of Persia of Persia functions well as a figure of someone else's fantasy. So now we find out what the real problem is. People would love to say how great it is that some homosexuals or woms might get turned on by Revenge Man Beheads a lot, but ultimately the target audience isn't those people because the creators often genuinely don't understand what that part of the audience would want. Stories that actually cater to those audiences are more likely to happen by accident, and when a story maybe actively caters to that audience, guess who starts complaining? Square Enix even had to change a male character's outfit in Mobius Final Fantasy because it was deemed too much. We're seeing a game space consciously being altered to suit the ideals of a specific group at the exclusion of others. They didn't cover up this guy because women or gay men preferred him covered up. They covered it up because someone found it icky. But where's the uproar? The complaints about self-censorship? If you move a character two pixels over on the western version of your box art, there's an army of people People crying foul, hearts ready to bleed for the creator's vision of how the panties were supposed to look on an advertisement. People seem to only care about waging internet war to defend a creator's artistic freedom when it's the freedom to service them in particular. The freedom to service someone else is treated like a mistake or mostly ignored. Save Trace's butt, but eh, whatever. It's just a costume change. Why get hot and bothered about THEY DID WHAT?! So ultimately what happens is one particular group's fantasies, expectations, and preoccupations get normalized, and what that group happens to prefer becomes synonymous with good game design. And this obsession with fulfilling a very specific power fantasy for one particular demographic isn't just some theoretically bad thing for the feminazis to worry about, uh, it genuinely impacts the quality of the games. Let's look back at God of War's story. This is a game set in a time of myths which are literally defined as cool stories stories that are fun and interesting and timeless, and yet the game does everything it can to not have a story that isn't an incredibly generic revenge fantasy. The player isn't made to really care about Kratos' loss or what his family was like or whatever. They receive the information that his family's dead and he wants revenge as a flimsy justification for what they were already doing in the game. It's uncompelling, to say the least. You can say the story doesn't need to be deep, and it doesn't need to be. I mean, if you think about it, no story needs to be good. Heart of Darkness didn't need to be a masterpiece either, but imagine for a second if God of War's story was surprisingly meditative on the nature of vengeance, and used the death of the ancient gods as a metaphor for the actual collapse of those belief systems, and Kratos was relatable on some actual emotional level. You got all the murder, but you got some real character and story with it too. Wouldn't players be holding this up as the game they'd always wanted? Or would it really totally ruin the experience? When Gears of War 3 inserted some small elements of genuine and pathos to the story, just a smidge, just a whisper, a sniffle. Oh, he took off his hat because his friend died. Now I know he's sad. The players who weren't deriding this as gay emotional complexity crap found it surprisingly touching and that it added something to their experience. Gears of War 3 delivers some truly emotional moments and boasts the best storytelling the series has seen so far. The video I stole this footage from is literally titled The Saddest Moment in Video Game History. Gears of War 3 got players to actually feel something about their otherwise bland one-note characters, and some people heralded that as a beautiful thing. As well they should. When Bioshock Infinite bothered to have a vaguely human person attached to this elaborately designed cleavage, the director of the aforementioned Gears of War lauded it as proof that games had finally become art. Yeah, sure, maybe more of this isn't needed, but maybe it would be better. As games become more recognized as an art form and more differing voices start to be heard, more visions are emerging, and people are starting to appreciate them as different visions instead of as objective mistakes. Even games that used to be action schlock and didn't need a good story are starting to get them. That's a good thing. Remember God of War? Well now it's back, and it's actually made Kratos into a compelling and interesting human being. You're still running around hitting stuff with an axe, but now you're teaching this kid to fight too in this scary new world. You're watching Kratos be a dad. He's a little out of shape and older and he has a kid, but he's actually a more attractive character to some people now because he's remotely relatable as a human, which it turns out is a real turn-on. That's right. 
We're finally getting an interesting God of War story. It took 11 years, but we did it! But now the bar's been raised, the sequel needs to go even further. How about a quick time event where, if you press X with the right timing, Kratos marries Brad Pitt and he convinces him to never grow a beard. And they spend their old age together raising dogs in an old folks home. And in the next game you play as the dog. The dog ties little chainsaws to his arms to save his dog husband from Zoroastrianism or something. And it's a gay dog who got married and they had a cute ceremony in the beginning before he gets kidnapped. Look, Sony, just give me a call. I have a 156 page treatment for Dog of War. Thanks for watching. This week I'd like to personally thank Aaron Solzbrun, Alex, Lem Alex Lemkovich, Alicia Parker Martell, Amy B, Bill Mock, Bob, Casey Schneibel, Kieran, Corwin Light Williams, David Rose, Desmond R, Ed Costigan, Femin Ninja, Grafen Blackpaw, and. Here are what? If you'd like to make a video response explaining how I'm a dumb cuck and straight men need to be the demographic and how I'm the real sexist and all women secretly love beards, please make it quickly because I'm working on a video about video responses to my work and it would be a shame if your objective, rational, true facts didn't get included. Wait, what's that noise? No, stop! You can't kill me! I created you! I created you! <laughs>